You're listening to The Voice of Russia in London. I'm Tim Eckert, and today I'm in conversation with the journalist and broadcaster Jane Labus. We'll be talking about the extraordinary mosques and libraries of Mali, now under threat from political unrest. The West African country of Mali is perhaps best known for being the home of Timbuktu, sitting right on the edge of the Sahara. But in recent months, northern Mali and Timbuktu have been off-limits to visitors because of rebel activity and armed revolts by the nomadic Tuareg, who want some form of self-governance. And in the last few weeks, there have been reports that the ancient mud temples, mosques and libraries of Timbuktu have been vandalized by the Ansar Deen, who may be connected to Al-Qaeda. The cities of Timbuktu and Djenne are World Heritage Sites, and there are fears that these mud buildings, some of them 600 years old, could be permanently damaged. Jane Labousse was awarded a bursary by the Royal Geographical Society to make a study of the men who preserve the ancient art of building using mud. In our London studios, I asked her why these historical sites in Mali are so very special. They're extraordinary. If, when you walk into Djenne, uh, you, you come through a series of little streets um, and it, there's just no warning of, of what you're going to see and then you walk into this huge square and there's this absolutely enormous mud mosque um, with these sort of rounded, um, rounded turrets uh, and each one is topped with, a, with an ostrich egg. <laughs> and it, it's... I mean, I've I've never seen anything like it in my life, and I. And I when we say mud, these are quite big, substantial structures oh, with with wooden um, crossbeams holding them up. Yeah, so they're they're the the wooden crossbeams don't hold them up. Um, the wooden crossbeams are actually um, put into the structure by the masons so that they have a means of climbing up and down when they reclad it. Because they mud. look they look like a sort of a, a old fi a pineapple with cocktail sticks in it, don't they? I mean, yeah, almost. A you see bit, these wooden yeah. beams sticking out, yeah. and I assumed they were part of its structure, mm. but they're not. They're actually they're scaffolds. So the the when I was there last March, um, it was a time for the masons to do some construction work on the big mosque, and um, they were climbing up and down. They used those to get a foothold. And and the the mosques they're made out of a mixture of rice husks and river mud. Um, they tread it with their feet, um, and uh, it's a very it's quite a complex process. The whole process of building the mosque is in itself a very ancient art, and um, there's a lot of myth around the masons. They're all, they're mason magicians basically, and they're seen as these very they quite, have quite sacred positions in the community, bearing in mind that the mosque is the, the, the key religious site for the community. Um, and that the big mosque in Djenne is the biggest, but these mosques are dotted around that area of Mali. And then in Timbuktu, you've got a lot of very ancient, very ancient structures as and well. And these ancient ones in Timbuktu are the ones that have been in the news recently that mm. we've heard that these uh, Islamist rebels or fundamentalists, whatever you like to call them, have been deliberately damaging yeah. these any idea why they should choose these objects no to I, i've been reading up a lot about it and there's no reason because i mean mosques are, are so sacred to islam and, and muslims and when i've talked to to muslim friends of mine they're as shocked as as we are about this this whole destruction and i think really it's just a a, a, a sort of showing how big and brave and strong and powerful they are it's some kind of you know gesture to show that they can do anything but what's happening presumably it's also about proving that the government in bamako doesn't control the whole of mali and that this is a, an act of rebellion yeah i mean that for, for a long time that northern part of mali has been an area which has been disputed that the tuaregs wanted have wanted that as an independent state but now um the tuaregs have been driven out and it's by this group, Ansar Dean. Yeah. Do, do you know much about them? No. I, when I was there, um, it was a sort of spectre of... <laughs> there was a big, big risk of kidnapping when I was in Mali. And um, I knew about Al-Qaeda in the northern Maghreb. And there was always a cell up in the in that northern desert part. Um, and now I I think that that cell is... They, they've teamed up 
um, with that group. But you got quite uh, involved in the culture and trying to get to the bottom of, of how the builders, these sort of shaman slash witch doctor type figures who are the builders. Tell us a little bit about how that building process works. Yeah, I mean, it's it's very, uh, there, there are two sides to this. So the art of mud masonry is a very ancient art and the, the head masons in the communities are very important and they're, they're artisan um, builders who they they will learn that um, skill as they grow up. So they'll become an apprentice um, when they're about 10 or 12 and they'll be apprenticed to the head mason who will then teach them this art. And I met, I met the head mason in Jenne who was called Kumbaba and then I also met I met a grown up apprentice who was twenty eight, um, who told me that it, you know it had been he had been years in the teaching of this, and so how it works is that the Kumbaba will direct all the building of the, in the town, um, because all the houses are made from mud, and he'll also direct the recladding of the mosque in Jenne. Because although uh, we're told that these, particularly these protected buildings or these uh, UNESCO favoured uh, buildings, they're so extraordinary for their architecture, but they they date in one sense back to the 14th and 15th centuries, but presumably because they're made of mud, they need constant upkeep and refurbishment. Yeah, they, there's a famous festival um, every year that happens in Jenne, which actually hasn't happened for a couple of years, which involves the recladding of the mosque. And it's um, it's a big festival for the local community. And um, it's also, I found out, is an opportunity for the youth to, uh, it's a youth dating opportunity, um, because they all go down to the river and celebrate. So it's the key time in the year. And um, yes, and, and the mosque in Jenne, the current mosque isn't that old. It was built at the beginning of the last century. Um, but some of the mosques are much more ancient, but they need constant... Th- the people in Jenne and, and anyone living in a mud house are in a constant state of renewal. They constantly have to build up the mud because of the rains just come and batter it. And I guess being there made me really question the, the structures are so beautiful, but I'm not sure that for communities living in mud houses, that's the best way. And th- there's a whole debate around that that I found we talk about mud we assume it's a relatively easy material to work with but these are quite large uh, structures and very distinctive in in their style can anyone build one of these things i mean how difficult is it to build one of these mosques or structures it's a real art i mean these are so beautiful um if you anyone i've shown my pictures of the great mosque to is just it's quite an overwhelming style of architecture It, it really does it's almost got this sort of space age but ancient thing going on very indiana jones and i mean the the mud masons are called to bamako now because they're considered to be the masters at what they do so even when they work with con- concrete they bring this incredible skill because it's not you know first of all you're mixing your material yourself so you're creating it these structures are huge and and they're doing it all by hand they d- use no machinery no, no cranes or concrete mixers. Or and they're climbing anything. up the outside yeah. on these wooden stakes, which we see protruding yeah. like the cocktail sticks in the pineapple. Yeah, exactly. And uh, I mean, nowadays they've got, uh, they were using a wheelbarrow. I remember they were stamping the banco down below and then they were loading it into a wheelbarrow and they'd constructed a, you know, a standard plank that you'll see builders using and they were wielding the wheel, wheelbarrow up. It is astonishing when you see it happening. Uh, amazing that, and, and to have kept this structure perfect for for so many decades is is amazing are there lots of of mud masons around i mean is it a dying art it really is a it's quite a dying art because um in in the capital bamako there's a huge um, building boom but everyone is building with concrete and so masons realize that they can go and make a lot more money do they keep, do they ad- adapt the ancient style or are these just well the funny standard? thing is that that they'll they'll go and they'll work with the concrete but um I found out that the most modern homeowners will ask for the spell that is normally cast on the mud home to also be cast on their then brand new semi-detached. So these mud masons, as you were saying, they've got this wise man shamanistic uh, role. Mm. When they build, they also bless. Yes, absolutely. They create a spell. Um, the one I was shown was with millet charcoal and feathers um, and I wasn't allowed on any account to know what he was saying because this would this would break his promise as amazing he's not allowed to 
to tell anyone. And and he actually told us some quite quite frightening stories about when he was little and he was taken out by his uncle, I think it was, who was his mason. He was he was apprenticed to, and he was taught these spells. And it's it's very it's got a very sort of sacred, ancient artisan feel to being a mason it's not just you know a standard building job how accessible it may sound like a foolish question but how accessible is the mud how <laughs> difficult is it to make the the mud concrete if you like well there's a whole um calendar around it because there has there's a special time of the year after the rains when the mud is at the right consistency to collect and it's the elders of the village who will go down to the river and decree whether that banco is, uh, whether the river mud is ready. Um, that's why the, the um, crepissage, they call it, the, the recladding festival, has never been on a set date. It's incredibly difficult to go to the festival because you never know when it's going to happen because it depends on the state of the river mud. The Gene Mosque that you said was built in, I think, early 1900s. Give us a scale. I mean, is this the size of a four-bedroom family house? Is it the size of a, two London buses? What, how, would um, you, how big is gosh, it? Gosh, I would say the size of um, possibly two village churches. Um, it, it's a big building. It's a big structure. Um, it's very simple. So apart from the scaffold sticking out and the ost ostrich eggs, it's just this sort of very simple rounded structure almost a bit Dali-esque. It's, it's so fascinating that you have to go and look at it. It pulls you in. And at every time of the day, in the morning, you, you go and you, it's this sort of beautiful, it catches the sun, so it, it's golden. But then in the evening, as the sun goes down, it, it becomes almost quite sinister and quite, it's almost got a personality. And it, it's, it kind of gets to you. And I found, I've got so many photographs of this building, it's not normal. It's, you get slightly obsessive about it. What do you think culturally Mali would lose if this destruction process continues, if, if some of these very old mud buildings are lost? What would that do to Mali? I think it's a serious situation because, bearing in mind this is one of the poorest countries in the world, and the one thing that Mali has to offer is offer tourists are these incredible pieces of architecture. It, if you go to Mali, you go to see that, and to destroy the one thing that Mali can offer to tourists is so sad and, and they're so proud of their heritage and they, these are beautiful buildings. You won't find them anywhere else in the world. To, to destroy that, I, I just think is, it's dreadful. Timbuktu, the name has this romantic ring, particularly for English language speakers, but without the mud buildings, would you go to Timbuktu? Yes, I think it's got that. There's, there's something about about it um i mean it hasn't just got mud mil buildings it's got these ancient libraries where um if i'm correct there are some of the most ancient books in the world are stored there and i think it's just got a sense of this ancient life that hasn't really changed much and and there's a whole other argument about whether that should change in itself but um from a cultural perspective you know somewhere like timbuktu should be preserved and you know, if, if if someone came and started battering down St Paul's Cathedral or any of our, our or Stonehenge, we would the world would be in uproar. And little Marley there, they've they've got all this stuff happening. And I I do think the world needs to to stop and listen and look and do something. This is the voice of Russia in London. I'm Tim Eckert, and I've been in conversation with Jane Labousse about the ancient mud buildings of Mali.